So, I have to confess, I had I had, I had uh, some good information to to talk about uh, our guest speaker, but we had a little problem, and, uh, and for some reason or other, I, I, it was lost. But anyhow, we have he, he'll tell you a few things about himself. Uh, we are very proud of ha having him here this evening. He's spent 23 years with the city and, and did, has done a, a very, very good job of keeping our utility system going at, at, the right co at the right price. And he's done an excellent job with that. So Terry is our guest speaker this evening, and uh, we, he's going to be probably talking 30, 40 minutes or whatever. He'll give you a little bit of time to ask a question shortly after that. We appreciate everyone being here this evening. And Mr. I wish I could do some bragging. By the way, if you want, he is a great musician. I, I should have told you that because he, he, he has spent m many hours entertaining this part of the world, and we appreciate him being here. Thanks a lot, Mr. Thank you, Carl. Right, sure. Appreciate it. Absolutely. He's also in the Cajun Music Hall of Fame, too. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you imagine that? Cajun Music Hall of Fame. On two pas français là-bas. Comment est-ce que ça fait? Vous avez ici qui parle français? Dis ouais. Un, deux, trois, quatre, cinq, six, sept, c'est bon. Ok, je vais faire mes, mes annoncements en, en français, ah ben. Uh, the rest of you English folks, you'll have to ask a French speaker. Uh, speak in people, what I said. No, I'm not going to do that to you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm from Brook Ridge originally, which is why I talk the way I talk. And I went to college, and uh, it was great to see my, the dean of the College of Engineering, Dean Reeves, here. Uh, he, was, uh, he was my mentor when I was in school, and I uh, really uh, learned a lot from him. And I just had a lot of good, lot of good friends here. If I try to talk, hit all of them, I'm going to take probably too much time. But I just want to thank you all for being here. And I, I, um, I, uh, I'm enjoying retirement to some extent. Uh, but I enjoyed work a lot more. Uh, but it, it is it it is something uh, to to behold, and I uh, congratulate all of you who has made it to retirement and are enjoying it that way. I'm going to share with you the story of what happened with LUS uh, uh, in the last uh, year and a half. I remember when I first became director of utilities under Kenny Bowen back in 1994. It wasn't long before I. I got to know an elderly gentleman by the name of uh, Kali Saloon. And Kali, um, for those who knew him, uh, had a photographic memory of just about everything. And he, he had done a lot of research about the utility system back when he was younger. Uh, and as a result, you know, he had a lot of pride in what that utility system meant to the city. He saw the various efforts, he personally saw the various efforts to try to dismantle that at different times, uh, either by investor-owned utility companies trying to take over the system or trying to do things with the uh, co-ops. Uh, and throughout those many years, the system survived and it flourished. And it became a very great um, asset for the city of Lafayette. So when the issue of selling the utility system came up last year, you know, I thought about colleagues and what he would have said had, that, had he been around when that, that took place. I'm sure there would have been some very long dissertations at the podium. But I'm going to share with you what took place there, some lessons learned out of all of that. Um, just like many things in life, we, we don't take things for granted. You know, you've got you to keep on nurturing it or others, otherwise sometimes things can go the wrong way for you. So I call my little presentation Saving LUS, and I put Baton Rouge and New Orleans in there because I use parts of this presentation to speak to other utility companies around the country. Uh, that's one of the things I've been doing since I've been out. I've been having folks have contacted me to talk about well, what, what happens, what would happen if this happened to our own utility system, you know, what should we be prepared for, what should we have done ahead of time, and so forth. So there's some things I could share with them on that. So we have initial background for those. How many people are LUS customers here? Okay, so thank you. So now I'm going to kind of share with you what that means. We have an electric system, we have a water system, we have a sewer system, and we have a telecommunications system that serves the city of Lafayette and some areas outside of it. The city of Lafayette has about 125,000 people in it. Um, the revenues of the utility system is about $260 million a year. So it's a very, very large source of revenues for the city. 
And the electric side of it is $200 million. So the biggest, and which makes sense, right? You look at your utility bill and you look at what the, what the electric is, what the water, what the sewer is, you see that the electric is always a lot higher because of what it costs to do that. Then we have a, a, a part of this that's, that's really the cash cow for the city. The city of Lafayette utility system puts dollars back into the general fund of the city. Uh, in 2018, that number was about $25 million. And those dollars are used for the city just like other revenues the city has to pay for police, firemen, other operating costs of the city, and keeping taxes down. So one of the reasons why ta LUS, uh, taxes in Lafayette might be a little bit lower than what you see in other large cities is because the utility system is providing some of that, that, that benefit. In fact, if you take a look at the metrics of it all but financially, the cost of police and fire to base salary is about that same $25 million figure. So you can basically say the utility system uh, through this in lieu of tax transfer is going to it pays for that. And that's a limited transfer. It's based on 12% of the gross revenues of the utility system. So you can't just go hog wild with that. You've got a, there's a limit, limiting factor that was set forth back in the 1940s uh, when the city was issuing bonds. It had to promise the bondholders that it wasn't going to raid the utility system to help out the city. So there's a there's a, a structured limit that's based into that, that's set up in that. The Home Rule Charter uh, that the city has had since 1976, different versions of the Home Rule Charter. Right now we have the consolidated version of it, but the, the Home Rule Charter initially had some language that protected the utility system, saying that the city could not dispose of the utility system or have someone else operate it or any of those sorts of things without having a vote of the people. And that was a good way to protect the system. So you didn't have just a mayor and council making a decision to you know, maybe divest this very substantial asset to the city. And I'm gonna talk more about that a little bit later on, but that's a, a very fundamental issue that we dealt with when we were talking about this whole issue with uh, selling the system. So I kind of laid this thing out kind of thinking of an, of an analogy. I'm not just talking about storms here. I'm thinking about the fact that, you know, when you're dealing with circumstances, you know, there are things that you do on the front end, there are things, things you do when you're in the middle of the fight, there are things that you do at the end. So I look at it from a storm management perspective and I pretend that we're thinking about what, what, was, what was life before the storm? What was life before this discussion about selling the utility system took place? What happened during the storm when all of all the noise was taking place, and then what happened after the storm. So, before the storm, it appeared to us um, that we had a good reputation in the community. Uh, we were real close to our elected officials. We, you know, a number of times I came to speak at events like this. You know, I, um, one of the practices that I um, learned through the years by looking at other people is that is that you know you've got to get yourself out there. I can't. I, I could have easily as a utility director stayed in my office and just did my thing, and you know a lot of things would have worked out fine. But you know, communicating with people and being part of community is a is a, a huge benefit uh, to get the support when you when you have when times are tough. So we support Festival International, Festival Zakadien. Uh, you know, like going radio programs, we have a hurricane handbook, just little things that we can do as a governmental entity that can be, you know, overall good for the community. From a rate perspective, we have a great story. Uh, our rates are the lowest in this particular area, lowest in the state. Um, this is the electric side, and you can see it right up against uh, Entergy, Slimco, and as long as Clico's around, we'll never have the highest rates in the state. You know, and that's a good thing. So it means that we're, we're managing our business in such a way that we're providing a competitive price uh, to the, the customers that we serve. And then when you look at the overall, not just electric, red on this line, on this graph is for the electric system, blue is for water, and the brown gold is just for uh, sewer. Uh, and you can kind of see that you know, we're not the cheapest, but one of the big reasons why we're not is because we're spending a lot of money on sewer upgrades. You know, where we live in this area, you know, the, uh, 
the, the altitude is low, there are a lot of uh, difficult, uh, difficulties in flowing sewer, dealing with, the, with sewer is a very difficult uh, situation to deal with, and there's some main things we have to go through that we're doing in a, in a very careful way to spend our money and uh, keep, keep those systems to be uh, viable. But again, very attractive uh, deal to our customers as we see it. Price is important, but I've always said that when the when the power goes out, people don't give a darn what the price is anymore. Yeah. Just get the price back on. Just get the power back on. And so there's two indices that the industry uses to measure that. And that is looking in, is how often do the lights go out and how long are they out when they go out. Okay, those are two things that affects people the most. And so they've got you know, we've got all, of all these acronyms here, but the System Average Interruption Frequency Index, SAFE, as we like to call her, uh, is, is what we use to look at, you know, lower the number, the less the number of outages, okay? And you can see in the last, you know, three years where we are compared to other utility systems. So besides having really low rates, we also have very high reliability, very few customers being impacted. Uh, or very few frequencies of outages rather taking place. The, the, next, the other side of that is the duration. How long is the power out? And that's measured in minutes, and you can kind of see compared to the other utility systems how well LUS has fared. So in, in both from a frequency perspective as well as a duration perspective, we keep the, 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 the lights on. How much is reliability worth? But there's actually some work done by the Department of Energy that takes a look at that based on that the SAID in safety numbers I just showed you there and the number of customers that you have, residential customers as well as commercial customers. You know, if you think about it, when your lights go out at your home, it's an inconvenience. When it goes out at your business, that means the cash register isn't running. And so the impact or the cost of a power outage to a commercial customer is much, much bigger than it is a residential customer. So when you pour those numbers in there, we saved, our customers saved $180 million in the year of 2017 as compared to the average of the rest of the guys in the state, rest of the utility systems in the state. So that means that we're, because we're spending effort to keep the reliability high, it's saving money for our businesses and, and residences in the state and what in the city. And, you know, we're using best practices for technology and we have a passion for system maintenance. Uh, I'm always new through my time. I worked for Clico when I was in college. I worked for uh, Gulf State Utilities and Entergy before I came to work for the city here. So I learned kind of like the best of what everybody had to offer as I went through my process and uh, with LUS and you know we decided that we really need to focus on making sure reliability is that high and now we have a number to kind of show that that really means something to our community. Um, there are a lot of requests about getting renewables on our system. Uh, some folks don't like the fact that we operate with a coal plant. Um, it's, a, it's an asset that we've had for a long time and it makes good sense for us to operate it at minimal levels but we, we, for reliability purposes you need to have that. Uh, we began pushing to try and get more renewables in our portfolio. So basically a third of our power today comes from renewables. And one of the big points I made to the, to, to the environmental folks out there was to say, look, I don't want to do something that brings in renewables and causes utility rates to go up because that hurts everybody. As long as we can find ways to get renewable energy at prices that's, that's very close to what it would cost us normally to operate, then it makes good sense for us to do it. And so that's what we've done. We've had, before, before uh, this uh, 2019, we probably were somewhere around in the 20, 25% range. So we're, we're gonna be increasing that as time goes on. Um, like I said, no increased rates to customers as a result of it. You can kind of see where the trend of fuel has gone over the years, so that's a good thing. Uh, natural gas costs are certainly much more attractive than other uh, fuel costs out there for our conventional generation. And we do a uh, customer service, uh, customer survey uh, about every couple of years, and we get really high marks from our customers. And I, I've always told my staff, I said, it's a pretty good thing when you can get 
you know, 80% of your customers give, saying pretty nice things about you when you remind them that they're your customer when you send them a bill every month. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a positive thing and it's a sort of thing that we, we really focus on, on, you know, not just with this reliability and cost stuff, but also on how we answer the phone and how we deal with it. And of course, we're never going to get it 100% right. And some customers are more difficult than others. Uh, but in the end, you know, we des the customers deserve us to give it our give us our our, our best uh, for them to uh, uh, in rece reception of service from us. So the the LUS storm begins. New mayor, new vision. Uh, during the campaign uh, of last year, last term, there was a quiet discussion to monetize LUS. Concept is. Taking the LUS out of what it does today, try and find some way to get some more money out of it. And a driver of that was to try and come up with dollars to invest in the city, uh, in a city that's averse to, uh, to taxes, to increases in taxes. So it's not a, you know, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's certainly a thought worth ha having a discussion about. After the mayor supported our rate increase in 2016 to build additional generation, um, he decided not for us to move forward with, so we had the money coming in from our customers, but we didn't get to spend it because uh, uh, he said, I don't want you to move forward any projects uh, at that time because the Bernhard Capital Partners are making a bid to buy the utility system. Uh, I was kind of shocked when I heard that, even though I had heard the rumors before, I didn't really believe that would actually come to, to, to pass, but it did, and so, we were at a point where we were at a standstill. We had projects we needed to move forward with, and not just in the electric side, the water and the sewer side also, that were kind of put on hold while we were dealing with this situation. And that was 15 months before that Bernhardt Initiative was, uh, became public. So I got, a, uh, I, got, I got a chance to know 15 months before then what was getting ready to happen. And I was the only one that knew it for a very long time. Uh, and I was a person I had to deal with the, the Bernhards to, uh, or the group from Bernhardt to kind of deal with that. So it was a pretty stressful uh, situation. So, Mr. Bernhardt, he had a previous history in acquisitions. Um, he, um, they told us it would take us about four months to go through this assessment. It wasn't gonna be a long thing. It took over 18 months. So it just dragged on and on and on. Every time there was a, an exchange of discussion, it seemed like they wanted more and more information. Uh, the Bernhardt legacy was a Shaw Group, Stone and Webster, Chicago Bridge and Iron, some very reputable entities that in all cases were sold in, at a, at a, in, a, in a stressed situation and, um, and, and those in industries had a hard time surviving. Press articles reveal that those particular projects under the um, Bernhardt regime had multiple delays and infractions with nuclear plants and other generation plants and it was fines and jail terms. So it wasn't a real pretty picture as to what could happen if you took that same approach, uh, I felt, for the city of Lafayette. Hey, do you want a job? They, uh, within months, they offered me a job to oversee their new company called NextGen. I refused them. Uh, I was not, uh, I was pretty, Judge Saloom had pretty much got my mind very straight on how important utility was, and I saw it for myself through the years I was there. Uh, we were directed uh, to provide uh, this entity with uh, due diligence information, so there was this thousands of pieces of paper, you know, uh, probably a thousand hours of, 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 of my staff's time. At that point, I had to get my staff, some of my staff involved in this, because it got so granular that, I, you know, I, 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 there's no way I could manage that myself. We comply, but some of those records they asked for would, would um, actually violate some federal security uh, requirements, and we said, no, we're not gonna provide that. I wasn't gonna break the law, uh, even though they said they were gonna get it from us, but they never did. In the meantime, I, you know, it's kind of hard to keep things quiet when it drags on for 12, 13, 14 months. I kept getting different people asking me what's going on with LUS. I heard they're going to sell LUS, and I was doing my best dance, you know, to try and get around that. And finally, um, there was a one local press entity uh, was able to uh, get enough information from somebody mm -hmm. to write up a pretty good story. And when I read it, I said they pretty much got it, you know. And um, at that point, I decided that it was probably time for me to leave. Uh, I, I knew that I probably had more information, 
more helpful information that could uh, deal with the debate that was out there. And being an, an at-will employee means that, uh, that I can be released at any time. I don't want to take the chance of doing that after 23 years of service. Uh, so I decided to retire on, on my own terms at that point. I met with my employees and the press that day. Uh, the good news is that this was really not handled well, even from the administrative perspective, I think. They, 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 the council was taken by surprise. So the council didn't know anything about this that it read in the paper. That never goes over really well. Um, and also, the idea of entertaining a proposal for only one company versus other companies just kind of really smelled bad. Uh, so that made people skeptical. Um, Bernhardt's first pitch to the public in Lafayette was at a Rotary Club meeting, and um, the, the smartest guy in the room didn't know that I was a member of the Rotary Club, so I got a chance to, to listen to what he was going to have to say. Um, his first negative pitch was that we had a horrible safety record. Now you take a step back and you say, okay, we've got this big utility system that generates all this money, all the things that's important about a utility system, and the first thing they're going to throw out there is to say, well, you have a bad safety record, so therefore you should divest yourself with the system. It doesn't make real good logical sense. Um, and I was shocked to hear that because I didn't think we had a bad safety record. I've been involved in every safety meeting that we've had, it did, took care of all the discipline. I was in, personally involved in, in, in the heavy parts of it all. When I checked after he said that, we, our safety record is twice as good as the average for utilities of our class. So, I mean, we're doing pretty good there. So I don't know, I still don't know how they came up with that. Um, he promised a, a, a Fortune 500 company in Lafayette that would have a thousand employees. Uh, it's going to locate this, uh, uh, going to have alleged benefits of 4.1 billion to the city and have this big building that's going to be built there and uh, kind of going to basically Lafayette's going to be a starting spot to uh, take over other utilities in the southeast. So that was, um, that got a lot of people's attention. Uh, then, the, one of the issues that kind of came up, you remember I brought up this language that we had about you can't just sell the utility system without having a board of people. Well, uh, the legal team came up with, a, with a, an arrangement and said, well, we don't have to, we don't have, want to buy it, we'll just lease it for up to 99 years. And so it, you know, so then the control and the decisions are now made by a private entity that's leasing the system instead of going to a vote of the people like was supposed to have been to begin with. They said that that wouldn't conflict with the charter for a public vote. The mayor said not in nine years was too long, but he thought 40 years was okay. And of course, neither of those makes good sense. I mean, because by the time you go down the road that far, you basically have lost your system. So uh, they made a presentation to the council, um, and just re uh, remember again that they talked about here that it was $4.1 billion. That's what they told my Rotary Club, $4.1 billion of benefits. So now I'm going to get to the next presentation here that says that here's, now that number turned to $1.3 billion. It said the system was being run poorly, had a bad safety record, inadequate maintenance, inefficient generation. Um, they guaranteed that it would give the city $920 million of in lieu of taxes over 40 years. Remember the in lieu of tax number I talked about earlier, how that $25 million is beneficial to the city. They, um, they would pay off our outstanding debt. They would uh, give the city $140 million up front, and they would have some growth sharing payments if the electric base revenues increased by 2.1% per year. So that was their proposal. And, oh, and they promised to decrease residential rates, electric rates by 10% for the first three years. So that was their, their pitch to the council that night. So, question is, okay, so are we being run poorly? There was a 58-page report they put together. They never mentioned that we had the best reliability in the state, even though that information is readily available. Uh, so they just kind of avoided the stuff that they didn't want to include. They only had one one uh, sentence that said we had the, the, we had low rates, never said we had the lowest rates. Uh, they inaccurately criticized us being on behind on water and sewer and electric upgrades, and I guess the only delay we had was because we were supposed to be issuing bonds a year before, and that got stopped. So I guess that kind of created that discussion. Then we found out, as we, you know, some different folks were 
giving me all sorts of nice information that the um, they had already acquired uh, acquired some electric water and consultants and contractors. And so the idea that it had was that they were going to use their in-house work, uh, in-house partners to do that work, maybe avoiding public bid laws. So it doesn't take long to figure out the money flow, right? When you think about the fact that you have your own inside team that's doing the work at prices that are negotiated to Bernhardt, you know, I mean, you know, how, how's that land of working itself out that it could, you know, rise, increase the, the cost of, of providing services to the customers. There are $920 million of guaranteed in lieu of tax over 40 years. Uh, just to give you a perspective, our in lieu of tax was about $23 million in 2018. So if you multiply 23 times 40, it comes up to 920. So that's how they came up with it, just saying 40 years of what you guys are paying today. What they failed to recognize or failed to to include in this is that because the city continues to grow, that in lieu of tax number continues to grow too as we get more customers. As rates go up or two factors that, that affect that. Uh, our, our in lieu of tax was $8 million 40 years ago, but you know, so at that rate, it would accumulate to about $1.4 billion, which is about 52% more than what they'd be giving us. So we were going to really come on a short end of the stick. Just interesting play on words. The hard um, $84 million of debt they would pay off, they would pay off the debt, but the customer rates are going to stay the same. So basically, it's just get more profit and you know, be able to make, get a return on that investment very quickly. Uh, the hard $40 million of upfront cash to the city, when you consider a 40 year project, that's about $3.5 million a year compared to a $260 million a year system. So it's, it's real peanuts in the big scheme of things. So growth sharing payments. We haven't had an increase in utility usage of 2% in a very long time. You know, especially now where people are using more energy efficient appliances, uh, light bulbs, all those things out there. You're seeing most, all, most utilities are pretty well flat. So the idea that we're going to ever get to 2.1% a year was never going to happen. So it's a promise that can't be ultimately fulfilled. And to decrease the residential electric rate by 10% for the first three years was laughable because the residential customers said, okay, we got this figured out. You know, and so three years and after that, you can really knock it to us, uh, uh, hit us up on it. And, and the, the, uh, and the uh, retail customers were aggravated because they didn't get a break. <laughs> uh, kind of, sometimes having that little friction is a good thing. So then we had what I call the, the Bernhardt Carnival sales pitch. Uh, they were desperately trying to reach out to the community. They opened, they rented a building in downtown, started providing free food and music uh, to get folks to come in and so they could kind of indoctrinate them with what their thoughts were. Uh, they reached out to the business community in the chamber. They chose a local contractor to build their alleged tower. So you try to get people that would get some benefit from this to be able to jump in on it. And in the meantime, we heard that there was something uh, like a push pole. You know, push polls are the ones where they call you up and they, they ask you a question that they get the answer they want to get from you. And so uh, I never saw the results of the push poll. The fact that it never came out suggested to me that probably they didn't get the results from our customers that they expected. So the showdown council with the, uh, the packed house of the council meeting in November, it was my first comments uh, publicly with the, in the city. Uh, first time I came back in the city hall uh, since my retirement in July. I was close at that time that Bernhardt had made me four job offers in this whole thing, including the last one having been only 13 days prior to that hearing, um, and which is kind of interesting since they thought the system was being poorly managed. Why in the heck would they want to hire? <laughs> you know, that's, the council unanimously decided they weren't interested, that even the mayor said he wasn't going to pursue this any further. The nightmare was coming to an end, and it's, it's the citizens and the council that really made a difference, and the, and the press. I think it all probably came together and really saw the light as to what this was all about. But there was some unfinished business. The charter interpretation concerning the utility system needed to be addressed. The idea that somebody could interpret that you could have an operations agreement or a management agreement you know, to get, get around the idea of having a board of people was not, not the right thing. So uh, Carly and uh, some of my, my friends from LCG came up with, um, with, a, with fixing the charter for a number of reasons, including that particular provision, which I was very supportive of. Uh, and it, uh, 
the, the amendment passed, and so now there's language in it, it makes it more difficult for someone to interpret the language in the charter to suggest that uh, that you could have an operations agreement of that nature. So, you know, and I realize there's issues with where, where that vote is, but that's that's language that's very beneficial to us if we can keep it. Um, closing remarks. Uh, Word on the street, like I said, I've been going to other states and speaking, and they're hearing from <coughs> Bernhardt. And in fact, they're hearing from Bernhardt not only for electric systems, but also for sewer systems. For those who don't get involved in the sewer business, it, it, it's kind of like at the bottom of the totem pole. In a lot of ways, it's a very essential service, obviously. But it's a, it's a, it's a, syst it's a system that always needs a lot, a lot of attention. Because you know you've got you don't have pressurized water systems you know everything is flowing you might have some pressurized you know uh, pipes in, in parts of it but it's a very difficult situation to keep keep those things operating uh, and uh, and for someone to want to buy that suggests to me all they're trying to do is to take it over and then be able to find ways to run up the rates they're going to say we're going to fix the sewer system all right but your rates are going to go up and you get you get a profit off of that. Um, LUS has been a substantial revenue producer. Uh, without city ownership of the utility system, your rates would be higher and your and your uh, uh, taxes would be higher too. There's no question about it. Um, so we just got to keep our eyes open for such future ploys in the future. Uh, I think Lafayette certainly is uh, was a ground zero on this particular debate from a nationwide perspective. Uh, I would have preferred to have been somebody else been on ground zero. But that's what we got. That's what we had to do, and uh, we, it's, a, it's a community that really, really made this happen. So before I, I uh, uh, make introductions for Carly to come speak with you guys, I wanted to give you a chance to you know, ask any questions or make any comments any of you might have. I know some of you folks don't have opinions, and some have a lot, but we'll just try and manage it the best we can. Terry, the last couple of years. Can you go to the mic? Oh, you gotta go to the microphone. Yeah. Last couple of years, the, the fiber network is going up two dollars in January. Is that going to be uh, continuing? It's going to be in eighteen and nineteen two dollars a month each of the last two years. What two dollars a month for what? Uh, internet. Fiber. Internet. Yeah. Yeah. So on the on the on the telecommunication system, that is a competitive business that doesn't rely on tax revenues or utility revenues to survive. It has to operate on the market. And so we have to uh, make sure that our prices are less than our competition and our services are better than our competition, while at the same time making sure we have enough uh, adequate revenues to deal with you know, paying off the bonds and making it successful. So it's a competitive business, it's not a it's not a regulated business per se, so uh, as a result, we have to be careful with that, and it's a, it's a, it's a tough balance because no one wants to see higher rates on anything, especially if they were getting a, a certain speed of internet at one time and then now it's going up. The fact is, you might be getting a certain speed for one time, but people are using more and more of that internet, so there's, a, there's still a, there's a higher cost that we're incurring, and if we don't find a way to pass that off, then the system can't be totally successful. Anybody have anything else? This is a great time to ask any questions concerning that service. It's, it's very important. So if there's a thought there, we certainly invite you to come up and ask that question. Uh, the question I have is uh, energy uh, and other companies uh, are they still interested in um, making a proposal for LUS? I think that if the other companies see an opportunity to make a proposal, uh, that they would, they would certainly exercise that. That was one of the things they brought up whenever the Bernhardt thing was in, in, engaged, is that they said, you know, why, why can't we make an offer? Why can't Clico make an offer? Why can't Entity make an offer, et cetera? Uh, and so that could still happen, but you have to have someone in a leadership position within the city government to say, yes, we're going to invite that. 
So it's going to be a matter of whether the mayor wants to, you know, whoever the next mayor is wants to invite that to happen. Uh, my, my guess is that, uh, uh, that that probably wouldn't be the smartest thing to do. You know, it, wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, certainly wouldn't be smart for the city because in the end, ultimately those companies are looking for the bottom line. They're looking to make a profit. And, and they get a return on equity right now of somewhere around 11%. And so that's a very attractive deal. You think about, you know, what, you know, what investments do you have that's making 11 percent? Okay, and it, and what's nice about it is that it's it's, it's 11 percent by a, from a regulated perspective. You know, it's hardwired. It's not, you know, so so you know if we if LUS end up being transferred to one of those private companies, you know, I'm sure at the beginning it'd be a kind of a, a you know kind of a sweet deal, but ultimately it would become a higher priced arrangement. My only question was to ask Terry what he's doing these days. Now that he's retired, I think he's staying quite busy. But I wanted to pass on to you, I knew this young man when he was quite a bit younger. In fact, when he was a student in electrical engineering, and I was serving as dean of the college, each year a college will select a student to be their outstanding student and forward that name up to the university where they will take the eight or 10, I don't know how many they got now, one from each college and they'll select a student who is the outstanding student for the whole university. I'm always pleased to be able to pass on to you. I know Terry would probably not admit it. The college selected Terry as our outstanding student when he was a senior in electrical engineering. So then his name went to the university and out of that group, the university selected him as the outstanding student in the university. So I always want to pass that on and, and thank Terry. Now, he corrects me, and he says the university that year actually selected two, a female and a male. So I'll, I'll throw that in, but that does not detract from what I'm passing on about, about Terry. So the bottom line is I've never been surprised at the success he's had in his professional career. It's what I would expect, and it's been a pleasure to see that. In addition to that, my wife and I have enjoyed dancing to his music on many, many occasions. So, Terry, carry on. Keep doing good work. Thank you. There must be one more question out there, I would think. If you're unhappy with your... With your you know, your bill on electricity, you, you can actually come up and say something. No, I can't do anything I want to write now. <laughs> <laughs> the horse is out the gate already. That's right. <laughs> can he make a gumbo? <laughs> no, no. I'm, I'm busy fiddling while they're making the gumbo. I just want to thank you too, Terry, for all your hard work that you've offered our community. And um, I was wondering how many people it's taking to to fill your your place and also uh i would hope that certainly they continue to keep you in advisory on the advisory board and as uh part of the lsu continuing i mean you l u o u s l u s thank you be careful yeah and i think it is good to say that things are still going well the utility system uh the guy that was kind of like my second in command he was a fellow that was overseeing all of our engineering and operations and our capital projects. So it's certainly a big responsibility. His name is Jeffrey Stewart. Um, he's from L he graduated from LSU. Uh, he lives in town here, and he's been doing a really nice job. I think there's a search going forward that the the mayor ultimately makes a recommendation to the to the. Um, Lafayette Public Utilities Authority as who he wants to choose as the next director of utilities. So I think they're going through a process there, just running it in the interim side. I, I think he probably would be kind of throwing his name in the hat there. So uh, sometime, hopefully before the end of this year, the, the mayor will make a make a decision. Then, of course, the, the next mayor could make a different decision. You know, that's a, that's the that's one of the vulnerabilities of the job. Like I said, it's an it's an at will employee, and so even though 
You know, I mean, you know, I work for four different mayors because they all decided to keep me. Uh, at, at any time, they could decide not to. And so the next mayor, you know, may have to, you know, kind of take a look at that and see what would happen then. But, um, but so the, the system's in good hands. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the things I've been working on the last several years was my succession planning. I wasn't quite playing plan for it to be succeeding so so, so soon uh, but but regardless you know so I gave people more responsibility as time went on I put them in positions where they would be uh, a lot more visible in the community and uh, and I so I, I think the system is going to continue to do well going forward thank you Terry, I don't know if it's at the right time but I, I'm thinking you may be able to give us a suggestion in that we as citizens what should be possibly want to keep our minds on and, and continue to, 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 to have good service and to, to have a reasonable pricing uh, you know if there's any in your summation if you could bring this up we'd really, I'd really appreciate it yeah, I, I, I think uh, as, as time goes on the, the, uh, the cost of energy, uh, the cost of the energy, the fuel, uh, and that, that which, whether it drives a generating plant or whether it comes from solar or wind or uh, hydro, that that price has been stabilizing and actually kind of dropping down a little bit, which is a good thing. That doesn't mean that rates are going to get lower. Okay, so I don't want to get anybody thinking, oh, good, my utility rate will go down. Because the cost to operate the system, the cost to have to replace pieces of equipment, all of that has to be taken care of. I, I couldn't help but notice what's been happening in New Orleans in recent times. You know, they, that system there is very old, just like ours is. But, you know, I, they've got some major issues to deal with. And, you know, that's tough to deal with that sort of infrastructure in a crisis situation. Uh, so the, I, the best approach is always to look plan ahead. We had, you know, a five and ten year scope that we look at down the road to see what we're going to need to do, and uh, and and to try to make sure we're making the right investments at the right time so that our customers uh, aren't adversely impacted. Uh, the idea of getting more renewables, I think, is becoming more and more prevalent. Uh, there's some cities that took the approach of jumping into that early, and they were on the bleeding edge. It's cost them a lot of money, and they've had a lot of people very upset about that. Uh, but what what's, what I am seeing in the South is that there's more, um, uh, you know, wind uh, and, and uh, uh, wind uh, and, and solar energy. The prices for that are getting into that realm, like I mentioned earlier, where it's about the same price that we can get uh, off of uh, uh, from from natural gas or, or coal and so forth. So we're going to be going more and more in that direction. But you got to always remember to deal with renewables is that it's not there all the time. So you still have to have those those ugly generators sometimes having to build the cover. You know, for example, when we had the, the freeze in January of uh, last last year. Uh, you know, we, the, the grid was in tremendous uh, stress uh, because the, um, there wasn't enough energy available. Some of the generating plants had, had gone down and so forth. And so the worst thing you can have during that kind of event is start knocking people's lights off indiscriminately because you can't have enough generation to, to cover it. So you've got to find that proper balance, and that's what our team is going to continue to do uh, on that now. They're going through a, uh, an integrated resource plan, which is where you look at all the resources that you have, both internal and external, and try and find the right blend that can be a positive for the future. So I, I think that uh, I, don't, I don't expect utility rates to go up you know, significantly, but I do think you can always expect there's going to be some minor adjustment there. And the way I've always looked at it is that as long as we're keeping you know, close to where our competitors are, then it shows that, you know, all of us are doing our appropriate due diligence on how we operate the system and keeping the prices at the right price. We have a little bit more time, so I have one more time. If you have a question, it's a great time to ask now. Come on up. Jerry, I, Jerry, I noticed, uh, you have a couple of uh, contractors for pole line service. You don't have enough in-house. Uh, no, no. So for for um, for maintaining our poles 
and our lines, which usually are in-house people, if we're doing a major construction project that's going to be beyond what, you know, what staffing we have, then we'll, you know, we're going to hire contractors to do that. Uh, when we're dealing with tree trimming, you know, uh, uh, a popular or unpopular notion that we have to go through as part of what we have to deal with, you know, we contract that out because that has shown to be the most cost-effective way to get that type of work done. Uh, because you know, different different parts of the country have different needs of tree trimming at different times, so you can leverage that a lot better. Thanks again once for the talk. Uh, Kind of um, on this integrated resource plan that's coming up, what is something that you might anticipate uh, coming through this IRP process? Uh, is there like a particular area for improvement that you particularly anticipate uh, some work um, being developed in? Okay, well, for, first of all, I'm almost one year out of phase of what's going on over there. I, I, I do talk to people every now and then, but I'm not in the middle of the details. But I know that in general, what we're trying to do with the integrated resource plan is to make sure we're keeping a very good look at what's happening all around us. Because if you don't do that, if you don't know what the other utility companies are doing, if you don't know what the transmission line constraints are, that's when you can get really um, uh, uh, blindsided. And so we want to try to find all, all the way down the line, you want to look at what gives you the lowest cost and the highest reliability, you know, and, and, and and does it in a way that, that, that combines that so that you don't land up in a situation where you have, you know, um, some, uh, a bad experience. Um, when, when power is out, uh, people get very upset, and understandably. Um, I remember in my younger days at, uh, at Antigen, our Gulf State Utilities, that uh, when uh, Hurricane Andrew came through, uh, it affected all of us pretty bad, and we, we had probably about six, seven, eight days of power outages for some people. Uh, in the case of a little co-op, co-ops like a Slimco, this was, was what was called Tesh Electric, it was based in Generet, uh, they decided to approach their restoration the same way they had for Hurricane Hilda and Hurricane Betsy two decades before. And it took three to four weeks to get their customers back on. Those people revolted, and they ultimately um, pushed the board out and turned the system over to Clico, which has the highest rates in the state. Uh, so you know that's where I said that you know having having power outages is something that uh, that uh, folks see as pretty pretty non forgiving, and especially this day and time, it's just very different than what it was when we were kids. And uh, you know I'm, I'm aging myself, obviously. You know the power went out. Uh, number one, we didn't have to go to school. Uh, secondly, we, we, we didn't have an air conditioner anyway, so it didn't really make any difference. And, uh, you know, we could survive that, but now it's, it's really hard to make that take place. So this, this integrated resource plan needs to take all of this into consideration. It's very serious business. It can't be, you know, you can't make these decisions on, on, a, uh, on a concept. Uh, it's got to be based on, you know, what's going to uh, provide the, the best service at the lowest rates. And good news, like I said, renewables, renewable prices are getting better and better. And uh, I was just in, uh, in Alabama recently kind of listening to some of the things that they're doing there. And, you know, they're, uh, they're, not, they're not going full, full hog to, with it, but they are, you know, making some, some adjustments there, too, because you see the prices where it needs to be. And the same thing I think is going to happen over here. Jeff is very, very focused on that. Yeah, Carl is here. Oh, she, okay. Oh, yeah. oh, All right. All right, well, great. I wasn't sure. Okay. Would you like to please yeah, introduce yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So, very pleased to introduce to you one of my friends uh, that we worked together in the uh, Durell administration as well as in the Roboto administration. A uh, very capable young lady uh, that decided to throw her, her hat in the ring to become the next mayor of this uh, uh of this this community and this parish, uh, and uh, and and I've endorsed her. Uh, I forgot there's a there's a video somewhere of me me doing that. I think I, I think my Cajun accent wasn't too strong there, but I could have been. I'm not sure. So when I was discussing with Carol, you know, visiting here, and you want to kind of talk about the future and what we need. Well, obviously having someone who's running for the seat, and one of the things that was uh, impressive about her is that she she ran while Joel was still planning to run. Well, the existing mayor was planning to run, so trying to unseat an incumbent is always a very difficult thing. Uh, so she uh, 
just put her name in a hat, and uh, and I'll, I'm glad to get a chance to visit with y'all. So, Carly, home the bar, come on over. Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for having me. Um, Terry and I just spoke briefly, um, and I really am just coming tonight to introduce myself, um, and I'm hoping to come later um, when the campaign gets a little further along. I'm releasing a platform in a couple of weeks, but I thought that I would take tonight to just give you a high level of you know who I am and why I decided to run. Um, as Terry said, I worked in, at LCG um, for about eight years, both under the Durrell and the Robodeau administration. First as an assistant to City Parish President Joey Durrell, then later as the Chief Development Officer, and then the Planning Director under uh, Joel Robodeau. Democrat or Republican? Uh, no party, sir. Uh, <laughs> um, so the <laughs> there's a, a lot of mixed feelings on that one. Um, so uh, when I when I left, I left about a year ago um, because I had worked in uh, the planning world and the real estate development world on the public side, and I was interested in learning that material on the private side. So I've been with Southern Lifestyle Development for about a year. Um, over the past couple of years, watching um, the LUS um, item and other items in the community, I felt that we really needed strong leadership and strong communication coming out of the mayor president's office. Um, and that is something that throughout my career in various capacities, um, I've, I've always tried to do. Um, and that was something that just drove me into making the decision to run for office. Um, secondly, you know, Terry talked about it tonight. I'm, I'm sad that I missed the beginning of his presentation and I look forward to um, kind of going through the, the first part of it. But we have a lot of infrastructure problems in our community and we need someone who is a fiscal conservative to tackle those issues um, and a real opportunity, whatever happens with the charter amendments, to look at um, the budget differently through the eyes of a parish council and a city council. Many of you may not know the books of the city and parish are still uh, separated. There is one document, but every dollar can be traced to a city dollar or a parish dollar. That opportunity, when the charter amendments were passed, um, certainly if there are two councils, those members of the parish council will be looking closely at the parish budget. Those members of the city council will be work looking closely at the city budget. And then finally, economic development. And economic development is a really broad um, subject matter that takes on everything from public safety to quality of life, um, all the way on down to how we build a strong region. Lafayette, the city and the parish is the center of a 600,000 population Acadiana region, South Louisiana, South Louisiana region. And a strong Lafayette is critical to a strong Acadiana and a strong Louisiana. So whether that is working with economic development partners for jobs, working with our police and sheriff's department for strong public safety, um, or other issues on quality of life, economic development is critical to our community's future. So those are the basic platforms that um, are the basic issues that my platform will be built around. Uh, we have about a five month campaign ahead of us and I'm looking forward hopefully to coming back um, and talking more with you all and, and learning more about your concerns. Um, tonight I really just wanted to come introduce myself and thank uh, of course my friend Terry Huval who's a support I really appreciate and who's been a great friend, um, teammate and leader over the last few years that I've known him. So. Thank you very much. While you're up here, we uh, two weeks from tonight is our next meeting, and if you if you're available, we'd love no, to have you no, there. No, we already had that booked. John Newman with New Hope is supposed to be coming to speak on. All right, in two weeks on the first first Monday of the next <laughs> month. The first Monday of the next month. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. And would you get give her uh, Ella yes, your e email absolutely. if you would? Absolutely. Thank you, girl. Yes, sir. Well, you need you, you got a question or something? Well, come on. Well, you have a question of this young lady. Yeah. She was running like you're a rat.
Many years ago, I learned about the CAFRS, the Consolidated Annual Fiscal Report. Learned that from Ray Green. And I said, aha, uh -huh. I'm going to get a copy of that and go over it page by page. So I went to Joey Durrell's fine office. I mind you, that's too big of an office for, for people like that. And um, I talked to the young receptionist. She'd never heard of it. She went to the back of the office and talked to somebody in about 25 minutes. They figured I'd be gone by then. She came back out. Yes, sir, you can have a copy of the CAFR. It's 1,500 pages, 50 cents a page to uh, copy. I said, can I get that on a thumb drive for $375? Still haven't seen the CAFRs. Y'all still aren't publishing them. I'd like to see them, please. I think that's something we can probably handle. Um, the Those public documents are public, and so I don't work for the government anymore, but I'm happy to track that down for you. And, Thank you. And certainly once elected. Thank you. Very good. Is there any other questions uh, that we can take? All right. We appreciate everyone being here this evening and hope to see you in two weeks. I think it's the 20th of the month, and uh, that young lady will be there. Ella, would you please come and uh, to give, give me that the individual is going to be talking. All right, that, John Newman with uh, New Hope. New Hope. John Newman with New Hope. Okay. Talking on poverty. All right. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you all very much. We appreciate you guys being here this evening.